Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the Global Buildings Performance Network. And today's webinar is focused on the role of energy saving targets and regulatory measures and renovation policy packages. Key lessons from global best practices. One important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And I uh, just want to go over some of the webinar features. You have two options for audio today. You can either listen over your computer or over the telephone. And if you do choose to listen through your computer, please go to the audio pane and select mic and speakers. This will eliminate any possibility of uh, echo and feedback. And if you choose to dial in by phone, select the telephone option in the audio pane, and it will provide you with a number access code and PIN number that you should use to dial in. And panelists, we do just uh, ask that you please mute your audio device at any point that you are not presenting. And if anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you can contact the help desk number at the bottom of the slide. That number is 888-259-3826. And we encourage anyone from the audience to ask questions at any point during the webinar. To ask a question, uh, simply type it into the question pane in the GoToWebinar window and uh, submit it there. And if you're having difficulty viewing the material through the webinar portal, we will be posting PDF copies of the presentation to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as our speakers present. Also, an audio recording of the presentations will be posted to the Solutions Center training page within about a week of today's broadcast. And then uh, sometime in the next month, we'll be adding the webinar to the Solutions Center YouTube channel, where you can also find uh, other informative web webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. And in addition, the Global po Buildings Performance Network will also be providing a live tweet today of the webinar. Attendees can use hashtag global buildings to follow the live tweet and participate. Now today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Sophie Schnapp, Yamina Sahib, Jens Lawson, Peter Bach, and Ann Edminster. These panelists have been kind enough to join us to discuss the importance of energy saving targets and how they drive energy renovations. In addition, panelists will discuss examples from countries that have set ambitious targets and will provide insight into how these targets have been implemented and what role they play in policy development so that other jurisdictions can learn from their experiences. Before our speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations is when we'll have the question and answer session uh, where we'll address questions from the audience and where Peter Graham will be joining us to help address questions um, from you. And following that, we'll have some brief closing remarks, and then a quick survey for the audience. Now this slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center was formed. And the Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April of 2011. It's primarily led by Australia, the United States, and other CEM partners. Some outcomes of this unique initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources on policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar you're attending today. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. First goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Uh, second goal is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. And third is goal is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Now, our primary audience is energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. We also strive to engage with private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides is the no-cost expert policy assistance, known as Ask an Expert. And the Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So for example, in the area of buildings, we are very pleased to have Cesar Trevino, leader of the Mexico Green Building Council, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in buildings or any other clean energy sector, we encourage you to use this valuable service. 
And again, it is provided to you free of charge. So to request assistance, uh, you may submit your request by registering through our Ask an Expert feature at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. So in summary, we encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, including the Expert Policy Assistance, the Database of Clean Energy Policy Resources, subscribe to the newsletter, and participate in more webinars like this. And now I'd like to provide uh, brief introductions for today's panelists. Uh, we will be hearing first from Sophie Schnapp. Uh, and Sophie is a policy analyst with the global research team at the Global Building Performance Network. And then following Sophie, we will hear from Yamina Sahib. And Yamina is a scientific and technical project officer at the DG Joint Research Center European Commission. Yamina is also the head of the Sustainable Building Center with the International Energy Agency. And Yamina has 13 years of experience in buildings and appliance energy efficiency. And then after uh, Yamina, we will hear from Peter Bach. And Peter is chief advisor on energy efficiency at the Danish Energy Agency and with the Ministry of Climate, Energy, and Buildings. And he has worked with energy issues and policies for more than 30 years with special focus on energy efficiency over the last 20 years. And after Peter, we will hear from Anne Edminster. And Anne is the chair of the Trilateral Green Building Construction Task Force with the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. Anne is leading experts on green homes focusing on assisting design and building professionals in developing their capacity to create better buildings. And our final speaker today is Jens Watson. And Jens is a senior policy expert and advisor at the Global Buildings Performance Network. Jens will be presenting on behalf of Andreas Schirling, who had some technical difficulties and unfortunately could not be on the line with us today. And then I'd also like to introduce Peter Graham, who is the Executive Director of the Global Buildings Network. And Peter will be joining us after the presentations for the question and answer session of the webinar to assist with addressing uh, questions from the attendees. And so now with those introductions, I'd like to welcome Sophie to today's webinar. Hello there. Uh Hello there. Uh, I'd like to say a big thanks for everybody for being here today, especially people from California who have woken up very early to be here and, and other places who are staying on very late to, to listen in. Um, my name is Sophie Schnapp. As Sean said, I'm a policy analyst from the Global Building Performance Network, uh, and I'm in charge of the development of the existing building projects. So today's webinar's um, title is The Role of Energy Saving Targets in Renovation um, relating to policy packages. Next slide, please. Just as a little introduction to the GBPN, um, we are a global network with a regional presence. We have um, hubs uh, and offices in China, Europe, India, America, and uh, are now working more in Southeast Asia. As a network, we develop recommendations and, and share information on state-of-the-art policies for efficient buildings. Next slide, please. In 2012, we looked at three different policy scenarios for future building energy use around the world. You can see these three different scenarios on the graph uh, in, on your screen just uh, at the bottom right. The research shows that there's only one real path to follow that will allow us to reduce the energy consumption from the building sector. This is the deep path, and this is what we follow as our sort of ethos as, as, a, as a company. You can see that this is the green area um, on the graph, and it's the only real path that we can follow that will allow us to reduce global energy consumption of buildings by 2050. And in fact, we can reduce it by 30%. Can I have the next slide, please? So following the deep scenario means that state-of-the-art policies and buildings will be upscaled and upscaled fast, being fully implemented around the world within the next 10 years. And by state of the art, we mean deep renovation practices and net zero energy but new buildings. Next slide, please. So in order to reach this deep path, we need, in order to reach the deep path, um, holistic policies should be in place that support the, this transformation of the market towards energy efficient buildings. And again, you can see the red line here. We need to speed this up and make sure that this is in the next 10 years. Next slide, please. 
So being in charge of the DBPN's existing building projects um, means that we have one real fundamental goal, and it's to upscale deep renovations. So in order to achieve this, we, we're really undertaking lots of projects that will help us to allow this to happen. So last year, we published a report called What is a Deep Renovation? Um, we, we've noticed that deep renovation is, is really a popular buzzword that um, was really in need of harmonizing and defining. So using a consensus seeking process with a group of experts in the field of renovation, we came up with a finalized definition for what a deep renovation is. And you can find this um, report online on our website. We've also moved on now to define a set of state-of-the-art criteria for a policy package that targets energy renovations. This criteria feeds into the new policy tool for renovation that we have just published in March and that compares and analyzes 12 best practice policy packages using the defined state-of-the-art criteria. Um, and the regions that we've invited here to present their, their stories today are, are regions that we deem to be best practice from the criteria that we defined. Can I have the next slide, please? So with the findings of this tool, we would like to present to you a webinar series, this webinar series, on how to save energy using renovation policy measures. The series is meant to really take a deeper dive into how to set up a best practice policy package and more specifically individual elements of a best practice package um, using insight from best practice jurisdictions. Can I have the next slide please? The webinar that we're hosting today is the second of a series and we're going to discuss the importance of energy saving targets, how these are regulated, implemented, and how they drive energy renovations. We've invited three jurisdictions that have set ambitious targets um, to join us today and tell us a bit more about their story and how they were implemented and, and how important it is. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to say thank you and um, say that I'm very pleased to invite Yamina to talk next. She's going to give us an overview as to why these targets are key um, parts of being a success um, for a renovation strategy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to GBPN for the opportunity to uh, contribute to this international webinar on the innovation policy packages. Uh, for buildings. Uh, in fact, the building sector and the renovation of the existing building stock is one of the hot uh, topics in Europe because two-thirds of our uh, current existing building stock will still be standing here by 2050 and unfortunately because we had regulations quite late uh, after uh, the oil crisis in the 70s uh, and they have been strengthened uh, over time. Uh, so our building stock is basically leaking and it has an impact on our uh, energy dependency and on our uh, economies. Can you please go to the next slide? And uh, when we talk about energy renovation, I think what we need to keep in mind is uh, what is it about? Uh, from economic perspective, it is about investing in low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure. And buildings represent in Europe and in most of OECD countries an important part of our infrastructure that we have to make low carbon and climate resilient. I selected this graph from uh, an OECD uh, work uh, on how to, uh, how to make the investment uh, in low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure happening, what is the policy package that is needed. And you see here that the first step or the first element in this policy package is to set strategic uh, goals or targets. And uh, then this is the first uh, policy instrument that the OECD recommends uh, to the OECD countries based on intensive research on how uh, to speed up and how to make the investment or the green investment uh, happening. Why uh, the OECD comes with this conclusion? Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, because it is about investment and uh, investors and financial institutions need uh, to have uh, uh, um, regulatory stability and consistency. 
and this is something that the targets could provide to uh, to investors. Uh, we had in Europe a very interesting experience between October and March of this year. Uh, we had uh, DG Energy at the EU level working with financial institutions um, on uh, how uh, to drive uh, finance for energy in energy efficiency investment uh, and um, uh, investment particularly the first part of this work was uh, on uh, investment in energy renovation of the building sector and uh, the text that you see here is uh, from the financial institutions working group and for them uh, the long term uh, because of the long term um, uh, the long term uh, period uh, payback period of the build of uh, the energy renovation uh, there is it is very important for investors to have confidence uh, and to have this confidence uh, they need to have a stable and robust regulatory framework and from the the information that we know from different other projects that are not related to buildings, that are not related to green investment, this is possible, this stability and this consistency is possible only if we have uh, targets. Then when this said, the way to set targets, I think other speakers will come back to that, uh, could vary from one country to another. Uh, and we could, for example, and this is the case in Europe currently, uh, we could start with uh, specific targets for the building sector, uh, for the public sector, uh, sorry, uh, because the public sector uh, should be leading uh, by example. We already have this in Europe and uh, have uh, this in uh, some other states. And then we could have the ideal situation is to have targets uh, for the overall building so sector between now and 2050. In some EU countries, we already have uh, these uh, these targets, and other speakers we go through that. And we could also do it per building segments, public sector first, or uh, commercial buildings first, or uh, we need to have a timeline. But most important is that the driver for the finance institutions is to have this stability and to have this consistency in the, in the framework that we have. And this, uh, we don't know any other policy instrument that provide that at this time, uh, apart from uh, the targets. Thank you for your uh, attention. And thank you, Yamina. Uh, and now it's Peter back from uh, Denmark. And welcome to all of the, uh, the people here with the attend this uh, webinar. Uh, I will speak a bit about the Danish case uh, and uh, uh, about how we have had used political commitment and uh, targets as a way to drive energy efficiency and the change of the whole energy system to a more sustainable uh, way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have uh, had a very strong energy efficiency improvement in Denmark over the last uh, uh, 40 years. Uh, we have, uh, for since 75, uh, decoupled energy consumption and economic growth very dramatically. Uh, and we also doing this today and have doing that, uh, been doing that over the last five years when we have had an economic crisis. This has been done by a very strong political commitment uh, for over the la uh, since uh, the first oil crisis in '73. Energy policy has been very high on the agenda in Denmark, uh, and we have used a combination of policies and measures in all sectors, including energy taxation, regulation, and information and awareness. Next slide, please. And uh, we have now a long-term goal or target, you could call it. Uh, that we in Denmark in 2050 would have an energy system which are 100% based on renewable energy sources. We will not use any fossil fuels anymore in Denmark in 2050. That's our overall target. And it's quite clear that the way we can reach this long-term target is uh, we uh, have a strong improvement in energy efficiency in all sectors. That's include uh, electrification. And we have uh, um, also, of course, to develop more renewable energy uh, and, and uh, as a way to uh, get rid of gas and coal and oil. Uh, and um, so we need uh, new measures uh, and new targets to deliver that. Next slide, please. Uh, we have already re reduced energy consumption in our building stock quite dramatically. The consumption per square meter today is 45% uh, lower 
than it was in uh, uh, 75. Uh, we had a very, very dramatic improvement uh, from 79 until 84 after the second oil crash where energy prices went up. Where, but we, that was also a combination of uh, a, a huge information and awareness campaign and a huge subsidy scheme. So all these things worked together. Uh, it, so so that it was a combination of measures was delivered and that has continued afterwards. Next slide, please. Um, for new buildings, uh, we have developed our building codes uh, as a very, very important tool uh, to deliver uh, energy savings and reduce energy consumption in buildings. We have had a regular update of building codes. We have had over the last years a very early announcement of next step. Uh, we uh, had the, a building code 2010. We have already five years back announced the 2015 step and we have also set the 2020 step, which are a step which fulfill the nearly zero energy target. Uh, these early announcement of next steps of building codes give the industry and the whole construction sector time to adapt, how, time to learn, how, time to develop the solutions, and that reduce costs uh, and make uh, the strength of the building cost cost, cost effective. Uh, of course, enforcement are a very important element of building codes, which we all have to work with. Next slide, please. Uh, in our existing buildings, we, that's the main uh, uh, target and the main uh, challenge for all of us in Europe, uh, at least. Um, most of the buildings which we have today uh, will be there in 2050. We have to secure that the whole building stock has been almost been renovated uh, over, the, uh, over the next uh, 35 years. Um, and uh, this means that we um, has uh, there's still a very big potential. Um, we have to see energy renovation as a part of the normal renovation cycle. That's the way to do it in a cost-effective way. Uh, that's also a way to uh, have uh, the house owners, uh, the building owners uh, involved. And uh, we have to have renovation as a, when we, as a part of integration of all elements. And we have to look at both a holistic and components. And we have to secure deep renovations. And we see that that will have a good economy, uh, both for society and for house owners, and especially if we include all the other benefits that uh, are linked to energy renovation. Um, we have just uh, developed a new renovation strategy, and uh, the strategy shows that uh, we can reduce our uh, energy consumption in uh, the existing building stocks with at least 35%. Uh, with, uh, if we strengthen our uh, uh, the building codes for existing buildings. Uh, if we develop them even further at, uh, and have new technologies involved, we could maybe reduce uh, 45 or 50 percent. Uh, we need a lot of combination of measures to deliver that. Uh, we have quite high taxes on energy for heating in Denmark. Uh, we have strong regulation, and we also have a lot of information and uh, uh, ac activities. We have obligation for energy utilities and so on, and all these measures together can deliver. Next slide, please. What can we learn uh, about uh, these things? Um, uh, yeah, I think first we have learned that political commitments are needed. Um, and we also have seen that a target, it could be a ta national target, and it could first step out these, these days be a target at European level for energy efficiency or energy consumption is a very, very strong commitment. We have also seen that target works. It's uh, very easy to uh, see monitoring progress and see how we online or take new actions if we are not on line to meet the target. So a target is a very strong political commitment which can deliver. And we need combination of measures. Uh, there's no s single silver bullet who can deliver these things. Thank you for your attention. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. This is Ann Edminster. I'm in California and uh, give you a little bit of perspective of what has been happening here and what the picture looks like with regard to um, retrofitting existing buildings. Next slide. So uh, probably many of you are aware that California has a reputation of being an energy leader and 
this means in particular, we've had energy legislation going back to 1978. However, more than half of our housing stock is older than that. And as a consequence, um, we have more recently begun looking at that housing stock as a potential area for tackling greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, it is the largest single opportunity remaining that we haven't yet uh, made significant progress with. Back in 2007, the California Energy Commission identified this and said we should really be tackling 100% of all cost-effective energy efficiency opportunities. So all of this is the backdrop for our target setting. Next slide. So in terms of targets, our largest one was established in 2006 with Assembly Bill 32, the Global Warming Solutions Act, which calls for a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by the year 2020. And uh, of course, we're coming up on that very quickly. It seems more quickly every day when we look at the magnitude of this challenge. Three years later, Assembly Bill 758 was established as the enabling legislation for AB 32. And um, AB 758 identifies a whole range of opportunities you see listed here as means of tackling this very ambitious target. So energy assessments, benchmarking ratings, uh, public and private sector financing, public outreach, education, and green workforce training. So I think the key message for the, the question asked by this webinar, are targets important in driving implementation? Absolutely they are, because the targets set the stage for what really has to happen on the ground in order to make the improvements. Next slide. Outcomes to date from the two assembly bills, the key ones are we've had a, an energy retrofit program called Energy Upgrade California targeting existing housing stock. And more recently, Energy Upgrade California has been directed to refocus from what was referred to as a widget-based approach, i.e tackling uh, individual items of equipment and so forth to a whole house approach. In addition, we have had efforts to develop a, a whole house energy rating called HERS-2, Home Energy Rating System version 2, that was intended both to provide a point of sale energy disclosure and also to assist in the identification of cost-effective energy retrofit measures. I'll say a little bit more about HERS-2 in a couple of minutes. But um, next item on the implementation uh, roster is a $20 million workforce development program. Also, property assessed clean energy financing pilots, often referred to as PACE. We've had a number of those. And then um, this last one, which sounds quite inconsequential, but nevertheless, it is a measure that is going into effect in just a couple of weeks with the latest version of our energy code. This one re requires that any residential retrofit must replace older plumbing fixtures with the newer water conserving fixtures. So, and one of the kind of interesting and perhaps odd paradoxical things about our energy codes is the codes primarily address new construction and major remodels that is they are they are large enough to be subject to the new building codes and although i think our codes are in many ways a much more powerful mechanism they don't tend to really touch the existing buildings very much so uh, that's one reason I wanted to definitely address this last bullet here, because it is a very, very small measure addressed within our largest policy framework piece. So, and yet our other elements of this solution set aren't code measures, but they are more specifically on the existing building stock. 
So kind of an interesting twofer approach. Next slide, please. One example in the workforce training that I've been very directly involved with was the development of a class series which is directed at existing home owners, designers, builders, trades, and so forth. And in this one, we spend four days typically presented over, uh, say, a one-month period where we walk through the whole suite of strategies necessary to achieve deep energy reductions or um, possible equivalent of zero net energy with the inclusion of renewable energy strategies on a building or within a development. And this class series we've developed to oh, some number of hundreds of attendees now in service ter territories throughout California. Um, we offer these through our major utilities in the state, most of them investor-owned utilities, um, but also a couple of the municipal utilities. Next slide, please. So another question we were asked to address for you all in this webinar was, who should be involved in setting targets and developing the enabling mechanisms? In California's case, we have a specific directive within our legislation that tells who the state agencies actually need to consult in the development of our strategies. And as you can see, it's a very, very comprehensive list. And I think that the question of who should be involved is pretty effectively answered by this mandated list. In other words, it's very comprehensive and appropriate. It represents a broad spectrum across our social fabric, which I personally think is very appropriate. Now, how effective we are at actually reaching all these stakeholder groups is another question. And I think at the state level, we do a better job at reaching some of these stakeholder groups than others. Not surprisingly. Next slide, please. Building sector impacts. Um, in the short term, the measures that I've enumerated have produced some new market opportunities for players in the building sector. Um, however, that also represents the necessity of training in order to take advantage of those opportunities. Because I would say relatively few of the players in the building sector were previously capable of undertaking these new opportunities because of the scope of ambition. We're really looking for building performance pretty significantly above the average state of practice within our building professions. What this means longer term is we still do need to be fostering the capability of the individuals and professional firms in accomplishing much, much higher levels of energy performance. Uh, one of the kind of um, unfortunate, unintended consequences of our relatively progressive regulatory stance regarding energy efficiency is something I refer to as the compliance mindset, where um, there's a tendency within our building professions to think that, ah, we're in California, we're ahead of the curve on energy, so really all we need to do in order to um, achieve appropriate levels of energy efficiency is to meet the code. And what this means is that in practice, our building professionals tend to get quickly familiar and comfortable with what it takes to meet each iteration of the code, and then their practice becomes rather stable or stagnant at that level without a continual striving for levels of performance above code. And so our codes do ratchet up, but um, A, I don't think that really drives the level of improvement that we need, and B, because as I mentioned earlier, the codes tend not to be so much um, affecting existing buildings, we don't really see that affect the existing building segment of the market nearly as much as I think we need to. So in the longer term, we really are going to have to figure out ways to get our building community much more up to speed on energy efficiency much faster. Another aspect of this in California, 
we have this mechanism called time-dependent valuation, which essentially says that energy provided by the grid has different values and different costs, different social and environmental costs at different times of day and different seasons. And our compliance mechanisms, uh, particularly our energy simulation models, reference this time-dependent valuation. And very few people understand this or understand it in any level of depth. And I believe that we are going to have to become much more familiar across our, our professions with the construct of time-dependent valuation in order to get more effective at addressing um, the energy needs within our state. This means we're going to need to learn some new tools and also uh, re-examine the toolkit. And what I mean by that is there are aspects of building design that we tend to overlook because they're not typically addressed by our regulatory mechanisms. In particular, um, building form, building basic uh, geometry and orientation, which we, of course, can manipulate less in existing buildings than new ones. Nevertheless, we need to be looking at them as well. Next slide, please. So lessons learned. Um, Energy Upgrade California, as I mentioned earlier, is, is currently being retooled. It's being retooled because the earliest stages of the program showed rather poor uptake. Um, in fact, the results from that, I suppose you could call the first few years a pilot, demonstrated that the efficiency gains were only about one-third of what were actually forecast. So very, very poor correspondence between the predictions and actual performance. Secondly, uh, those, uh, that program was largely div driven by utility-based incentives. And what we also found was that the amount of incentives were really not sufficient to induce the uh, sort of scale of remodeling that we had hoped to see across the landscape. So what we need to do is really figure out a way to reach people when they have other motivations for remodeling and find ways to support the energy efficiency upgrades at the time that remodeling occurs for these other reasons, because relatively few people will undertake those remodels purely for their own sake. So we need to get a lot more sophisticated about how to do that. Second lesson, important one, uh, that $20 million for workforce development was a huge injection um, for the economy in California. Briefly, a lot of people were retrained and introduced into new occupations. Unfortunately, there was not a commensurate effort to improve demand at the same time. So as a consequence, we had a lot of people who did acquire some new skills and knowledge and then went out into the workforce and found not enough work to support them in these new jobs. And a lot of those folks are yet again looking for new work. So uh, we did not really do a very good job of matching supply and demand. Now, as regards PACE, um, PACE has had notable success in a number of jurisdictions. And we have a couple of different flavors of PACE that are some of which are still in pilot. So I think there's very good promise for that as a mechanism for funding retrofits. HERS II, uh, again, I would say this is a program that it, it was very closely tied to Energy Upgrade California and was used as the primary tool for the sort of audit portion identifying viable energy upgrades, not seen as tremendously successful. So it has not seen a lot of uptake. And whether that will actually find its way into its second role, that is um, identifying energy performance at time of sale, remains to be seen. So a little early days to comment on those. And I believe that is all my comment for now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, this is Jens Larsen. I hope you hear me. Um, 
I will present this German case because uh, Andreas uh, Schuring uh, from the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy uh, couldn't make it for technical and practical uh, reasons. So I will give you some briefs uh, based on the uh, PowerPoint presentation that he sent us. Next slide, please. As it was the case with the two previous presentations, the German policy is strongly based on uh, long-term targets. Um, there are targets set for 2020, which is a 40% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions compared to 1990 levels. And there are also targets for 20% uh, reduction of the energy demand, but compared to 2008 uh, levels. There are further targets on a long-term, setting targets for 2050, where the targets are 80% cut in the greenhouse gases and 50% cut in the primary energy demand. These were set in the energy strategy back in 2010 and is the basis for the German uh, policies today. Next slide, please. But it's not enough to have uh, general targets, so there are also specific targets for the, the building sector and this is requiring that in 2020 there would be a 20% reduction in the demand. So this is another 2020-20 uh, target. And in 2050 this would go all the way up to 80%. This means that the whole building stocks must be almost climate neutral compared to today. And of course it means that new buildings must uh, reach this point much earlier. The interesting thing is that these kind of buildings are being built already. We know the technology, we know how to do it, but we know to upscale this uh, very uh, massively. One of the key points in the German policy for existing buildings, but also for new buildings, is the CO2 rehabilitation program or the KFW programs, which they are uh, called. And it is strengthening of energy consulting, which means that uh, we would try to improve the knowledge that everybody has on what they can do and how to do it. Next slide, please. Some of the primary uh, demands is the energy saving ordinance. That's where uh, rules are set for minimum requirements. But at the same time, these standards are also defining higher standards that you can go for uh, than the absolute minimum. So this is a kind of stretch code, I think they would call it in the US. The programs are all very holistic, so they focus both on energy efficiency and the use of renewable energy. There is a big freedom in the choice of technology, but it's in some way uh, limited. It needs to be cost efficient, because otherwise it's difficult to get the right uptake of these kind of policies. Uh, the KFW have developed efficiency houses branding, which they call KFW 55 or 40, which means that this is 55% of the consumption that you would have according to uh, the regulation or 40% in the higher case. Next slide, please. This next slide is showing the development in Germany where building codes have become more and more stringent, and the latest one came in place, I think it was the 1st May uh, this year, which is the 2014 building regulation, which is the current uh, requirement uh, in, in Germany. Um, at the same time, we have seen that best practice buildings have gone deeper, and the usual market standards have been uh, decreasing faster than the building codes. Next slide, please. This slide is giving a few details on the previous building code, uh, ENEV uh, 2009, and the current building code 2014. Uh, both of them are looking on the building envelope. Uh, the previous one was concerning heating, cooling, and air condition techniques and warm water. Um, and it depends uh, on the calculation methodologies, etc. The new building codes also sets requirements for standards towards zero energy and zero energy buildings, and it gives uh, different requirements for uh, renewable energy and for uh, primary indicators for these buildings. Next slide, please. 
the building codes have two sorts of uh, requirements. There is one, as mentioned, on the primary energy use, giving the freedom to choose between renewable energy and buildings, but to ensure that the buildings themselves are not built uh, to, to bad uh, condition, there is also a transmission heat loss which is requiring that uh, buildings are well insulated, there are good windows and all of these uh, building physics. Next slide, please. The KFW program, which is supporting these, have two sites. One is for the new building stock, and another uh, part is for the existing building stock. And here are some of the details on how big grants and loans that can be given. There are different uh, repayment bonuses, and uh, they all, in the end, target the home uh, owners. Uh, there is a requirement in both of them that uh, there is a need for an assessment by an expert so that they ensure that it is the right measures that are done. Next slide, please. This one has a, a very important and interesting topic, and that shows that different grades of renovation, because now we go into the refurbishment programs, uh, will give different kinds of subsidy. Um, we are looking at a uh, energy house, efficiency house 100 will be the same as the current uh, building code. Uh, and then we have better and better classes going up to 55% uh, in uh, shown here. And the uh, loans and the support and the interest rates that you get on your loans will actually depend on how deep you go. So this is an, a general encouragement not to do a shallow renovation, but to go deep. And this is very important for, uh, we expect that there is only one chance for uh, refurbishing a building. So if we don't go deep enough the first time, we might lock in uh, some of the potential. Um, you can see the percentages here. Next slide, please. This is a slide which is showing how the KFW is working. It's uh, uh, subsidized by the German government out from the left. It's uh, rated in the capital market, it has its own capital and, and rating for further loans. And then it is uh, having a mandate which is set up by the uh, government. And this requires what the uh, types of loans will be given and what types of, of buildings would be supported. On the right side you can see that it's usually done through uh, the bank. So this is using your own bank which would then get the loan in the KFW. This way, uh, uh, it ensures that the bank can add additional loans to uh, the clients. Next slide, please. The impact on this is shown in this slide, which is showing that given the red curve, which is the uh, subsidy from the uh, German uh, government, which is given to keep the capital uh, intact, even if the loans are given on very, very good rates, that gives an additional loan capacity which is five to six times higher uh, today than what the government is putting in itself. So it's a very uh, important um, accumulation of the capital. Next slide, please. These slides are giving a few of the details which is coming out of the uh, programs and as you can see they have been very significant over the last eight nine years where more than 3.5 uh, million housing units have been supported through this. Today it's nearly 50 percent of all new buildings which go for this loan this mean they go farther than the building code and it's 33 percent of the refurbishment. Uh, it also shows that 11.1 billion federal funds accumulated uh, 160 billion in investments so that the funding gave 12 times as much investment. And this is very important for the success. I would show a couple of the outputs of this on the next slide, please. This means that uh, it created up to 300,000 jobs and maybe the last year it was nearly half a million new jobs that were created because of these kind of loans. This, of course, gave an income for the government in terms of taxes, in terms of social security, and also 
less cost for uh, unemployment. The uh, studies have shown that uh, each one euro spent by the German government comes back four to five times uh, from these programs. So it's a good business for the government actually to run these programs. It also showed the need for intensive uh, training of people and uh, this is all the change from architects, engineers, uh, it's energy consultants, it's skilled employees in the construction industry. Next slide. I think this is just the lessons uh, learned and some of the lessons which we heard from, from Germany is that the more transparent and the more simple the schemes are, the easier it is to understand, the easier it is to distribute and the more people will use this scheme. Uh, it's very important to uh, have mandatory experts involved so that we ensure that it's the right things that get support, uh, that there is a high quality, uh, that the public funds are used uh, correctly. And it shows that these programs have had a very, very big impact in Germany. Thank you. This was what I was presenting. Great. Thank you to uh each of the panelists for the, the excellent presentations. And we uh, will move on now to the question and answer session. Before we do, I just want to remind all attendees that if you have any questions for today's panelists, uh, please feel free to submit those through the question pane in the GoToWebinar window. And with that, I'll uh, move on to the first question that I have for the panelists. And panelists, if you'd like to answer any of the questions, just go ahead and make sure you're unmuted and then uh, chime in. And so the first question I have is, when politicians change every four years, how can you then ensure targets of 20 or even 40 years ahead? And this is mainly for uh, Peter or Anne. Uh, Peter here. Um, it's a very good question. I think uh, it relates very much to some of the success we have had in Denmark, because all major uh, political decisions taken on the energy side in Denmark since 79 has been taken in a broad coalition between the social democrats and the liberal conservatives, uh, which has been included in all political decisions. So we have changed government from a social democratic government to a liberal conservative government, but the energy policy has been very stable because all agreement has included both sides. So policy has not changed every four years in Denmark or every 10 years. Uh, it has been a long-term tradition uh, of stable policy, and that gives high security for investors, for companies to develop, uh, and so it's very, very important. Thank you. Yeah, this is Anne. I would have to agree with Peter that uh, here in California, too, the strong pro-efficiency sentiment has really transcended party politics. And so while we've certainly seen ebbs and flows of interest in energy efficiency policies, um, the overall trajectory has been pretty solid. And we've had good stability in our public agencies as well. So um, we've been very fortunate in that regard. Great, thank you both. Uh, and the next question that I've received asks, uh, many of the interesting case studies presented today deal with more developed countries. So how, if at all, would these recommendations differ for rapidly developing countries like China and India whose share of greenhouse gas emissions are growing? Uh, Peter back here. Uh, I'm not an, at all an expert in China and India, but I think there's one big difference between uh, Europe and US on the one side and uh, the developing countries on the other side is in Europe and US uh, the major challenge is the existing building stocks. In China and India the major challenge is the new buildings uh, because uh, they build so much of the new buildings. Uh, so strong building codes, strong enforcement uh, 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 related to new buildings are very, very important. And set a long-term target 
uh, for how the building code should be developed over the next uh, uh, 15 to 20 years with stepwise strength in the code. Uh, that would, uh, I think that what we could learn from Denmark, that could be a wise way to go also in these uh, countries. Thank you. And this is Jens Larsen now talking from uh, GVPN side. Um, and I can agree with Peter that in, uh, in fast emerging economies, the, uh, the new construction industry is uh, the very important thing to get under control. But it is for two reasons. Um, the, the first one is if you don't have the, the new buildings under control and have a low uh, energy consumption, it seems a bit strange to, to renovate buildings and needing to renovate a new built building because it's not good enough uh, compared to the standards for existing buildings. But we see that uh, countries like China start uh, looking more into renovation policies because there is a big building stock and maybe some of it is built for five, ten years ago and we're not fulfilling the kind of standards which they, they have today. So this is also coming up in emerging economies. And I think the, um, the lessons that is learned from, from more emerged economies is that uh, it's very important to do things right in the first place and not do too much skimming and take the, uh, the very easy solutions first, but try to uh, really do an energy renovation when you when you start improving uh, because otherwise the potentials would be locked in for a very long time. So uh, this, this same this kind is, of request. This is Yamina. Uh, I tend to agree with uh, Peter and Jens about the difference between uh, emerging economies and OECD uh, countries. Um, and I would distinguish in emerging in first developing countries uh, two categories. Uh, China, for example, is in the, in the first category and Russia, uh, where we have at the same time the challenge of uh, uh, building a new construction. And in this case, uh, it is clear that if we do it right from the start, and which is, which is the case in all these economies, uh, then we will avoid to be in the situation that we today face in OECD countries where we have to renovate uh, to low energy uh, consumption of the existing building stock. Uh, in parallel to that, in China and in Russia, uh, we have uh, the issue of um, uh, uh, renovating uh, part of the, the existing, uh, the, the, the current existing stock. Uh, and in this case, uh, these countries face similar um, challenge. The challenge is uh, um, uh, similar like in OECD countries. Uh, so in, in, non, in, uh, in other fast growing economies um, uh, like India and uh, uh, now we see it also in Africa and other Southeast Asian countries, uh, I think the main message is to make sure uh, that they have uh, building codes that are not as weak as the ones that we had in our countries in the 70s, but their building codes uh, are as good as the best building codes that we have today in our countries. Thank you. Um, this is Anne. I agree with all of the foregoing comments. And the one thing I would add is what I see is we have uh, a lot of emphasis on the building itself, and yet a couple of folks have mentioned the importance of enforcement. I would go uh, a little bit underneath that idea that the reason enforcement is important is because compliance with codes, you know, based on the California experience, is not what we would hope it would be. And the reason for that is our building occupations really are not on board the way we need them to be. So I would offer that in rapidly developing areas of the world, we need all of those things. We need strong codes, but we also need very deep and broad education across all segments of society that affect our building quality. And that should begin with young school children and extend to um, young people who are entering building occupations as well as building professionals who are presently practicing. Uh, we've spent a lot of time looking at this issue in um, some 
ad hoc task forces for the California Public Utilities Commission over the last couple of years. And we began by looking at four segments, design professionals um, emerging and practicing and building uh, trades people emerging and practicing, and rapidly realized we needed to expand that list to people in real estate, finance, building operations and maintenance, the public sector, and uh, almost anything you can imagine. It's a very long list, and this is all about building our capacity at the most basic level of the social fabric to produce better buildings so that the regulations are met and enforcement ultimately would we would hope would become less of an issue because we calibrate the mindset of everyone who touches the building from the outset. Great. Thank you, everyone, for that great discussion. Um, moving on to the next question now. This one is directed towards Jens, Peter, and Anne. And the question is, how would you go about setting the level of ambition of the energy targets for a country and ensure that it is suited to the needs of the jurisdiction? Tough question. This is Ian. I, I would say that, um, interesting enough, I was chatting with a colleague about this yesterday. I believe that uh, this goes back to the stakeholder question, and we need the most comprehensive possible stakeholder group. Uh, how does the saying go? You want to keep your friends closer and your en or your friends close and your enemies closer. And so there will always be uh, elements in a society who resist progress, resist regulation, the climate deniers, and so forth. And yet, it's really important that. Um, again, everyone who affects the progress towards climate neutral building be involved in the discussion and that we really work as hard as possible towards consensus. It's slow and it's messy, but it is faster when we have consensus than it is to uh, try to, again, enforce in an environment where we have not really achieve the mindset necessary to make the progress we're looking for. Yeah, and, and I would like to tip in. I agree with these uh, comments on involving the stakeholders, uh, but I also feel it, it feeds back to today's uh, question about having targets, because I think it's easier to discuss this if it's happening in three, four, five years from now, where most people would say, yes, of course we can do it. Uh, then if we suddenly come and say, can we change this from uh, tomorrow? So I think having a, a, a longer term policy, which is showing that we are going this direction, uh, then uh, it's easier for the industry, for finance people uh, to prepare for it, to have the right products in, in place and to take the right tr training. And also taking into account that new construction, but also renovation, uh, takes quite a time from you start thinking about it until you have the building or the improved building there. So the long-term targets and maybe also mid-term or short-term targets. I, I would uh, also agree with uh, both Anne and Jens. Uh, I would only add that I think um, it can be wise to go from maybe a bad uh, building codes to where you want to be in 10 years uh, by in some steps. Uh, you cannot, uh, the construction sector, the workers has to be trained and learn, the new products has to be developed. They have to learn how to use them and how to build up a building which are airtight, which are with huge, good ventilation, uh, air, or good insulation. So, so do it stepwise um, and uh, then uh, and but send a set a, a target where you want to be in 10 or 15 years and, and then go there i think that can work thank you one more thought along those lines too i think that one of the challenges that we face is that we perhaps put excessive emphasis on design and insufficient emphasis on construction 
and this is sort of part and parcel of a larger cultural phenomenon that we face here in the United States, which is the deprofessionalization of the building trades. Um, and we don't have a very good formal education process for the trades as well. And so much of the progress that could be made in building efficiency comes from a very well-known, but in some ways unglamorous, not terribly interesting aspects of building performance. As Peter alluded to, it's air tightness and good quality insulation. And yet we have been looking for workers to do the fastest, cheapest possible work instead of the best quality work. And we, we don't have a consumer base that is really has any sensibility to distinguish between the two, and they don't see it because it's hidden. So we have some really systemic challenges here. Great, thank you, everyone. Uh, and the next question is in regards to the rehab program, and it asks um, if you have, uh, if you know what Germans' participation rates were in the rehab program. I think there were some uh, uh, figures in the slides saying that uh, today it's it's quite significant. It's something like a third of all uh, renovation projects which are uh, getting support from the program. It, it was in, in one of the slides. And for new buildings, it was uh, even higher. I think one of the interesting questions that I would ask, but, but which I can um, uh, respond, is how many went for the deep end of it and how many went for the, the smaller subsidies and, and the, 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 the small amount of loans. And I think that's where uh, the program still target um, relatively small, a small fraction of the market and where there is a need to, to uh, further upscale. But I can't give any exact figures for this. But we can ask uh, the German Ministry and and send uh, the response to this question. Great, thank you, Jens. Uh, next question asks, what is the, um, if you could discuss what the most important role is or what the roles are in the valuation and appraisal profession, and what can they play in driving deep energy greenhouse gas improvements? Uh, this is Anne. I think they can play a really important role and, in fact, need to play a very important role. And in our market here, that is a significant challenge. We hear over and over again that efficiency improvements are fail to be valued. Um, on the other hand, we do have a couple of studies in different parts of the country that show somewhere between an 8 and a 15 percent increase in valuation for retrofitted housing that is and um, that incorporates energy improvements so there's some good evidence and yet this knowledge has not been well dispersed in the appraisal and real estate fields and so there's still a very pervasive lack of understanding of these features in those professions, and this, this is a significant barrier we need to overcome. Peter, back here. Um, in Denmark, we have, uh, pick, pick, yep. seen, we have seen over the uh, last years that uh, the uh, energy certification of buildings, which are mandatory in the European Union that when the building is sold, uh, has huge impact on the price. Uh, a new study which we um, had done last year shows that moving up one class from D to F and further up to H, from done moving one class in the bottom of the scale, the price of a building would increase around 100 euro per square meter. Um, so, uh, and that's really a, sense a quite huge impact on uh, the, the, the value of your building if you improve your your energy quality and then get a higher rate on the uh, scale. So, so, that, so we, we can see that in the market today really quite clear. 
Peter Graham here. I wanted to just add that um, some of the work that our US hub has been doing has been looking at the impact on jobs, for example, from rating and disclosure. And um, from their, their closer look at, um, at the effect of policies like that, they're seeing a potential job creation of 59,000 net new jobs by 2030 just from that particular policy. Um, but there needs to be better, uh, better regulation of, of um, the, rating, the rating process, better trust of the data. Uh, and the data isn't really being presented in, in C-suite friendly formats either. Some of our work from uh, with, with the Economist Intelligence Unit and Real Estate Investors shows that. So part of the challenge is to is to be able to to reach um, decision maker investment decision makers with with respect to public finances and look at co-benefits like jobs. And the other is also looking at how we can get um, more trusted performance data to uh, the finance industry as well, and um, you know, providing a, a bit more of a bit more trust that would incentivise uh, greater investment in energy efficiency renovations. Thank you, everyone. Uh, next question is in uh, asks about Germany, but it could also be applied to other EU states. Um, and it asks, is it more important that Germany sets its own EE targets or that the entire EU sets common EE targets for all member states? That, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure I can answer on behalf of, uh, of Germany on this one. But uh, I, I definitely feel that something happened in the European scene when uh, uh, EU took a common uh, agreement on saving energy according to the Kyoto uh, Agreement. That was when they started to design directives like the EPPD Directive and currently the Energy Efficiency Directive. Um, and when this became a common uh, European uh, policy field of setting policies and, and this can help uh, developing standardized products which can be used in, in multiple countries and it also started maybe a trend where uh, some of the countries said if, if we have a common target on 8% we go for 16 and somebody else went for 20. So I think uh, we should probably have both uh, and I hope this also answers on behalf of, of, of the German. Thank you. I would uh, uh, agree with Jens. Uh, I think uh, also in the actual discussion now going on in Europe about the 2030 climate and energy framework, we, as, as part of that we need a, a, a target for energy efficiency at European level. Um, if we have that, uh, we could should discuss should we, uh, that be distributed with a target for individual countries or should we have a governance structure where member states should report their their own indicative targets uh, and then the commission should see if that will be in line to fulfill the European target. But we need targets at European level and at member states level. Uh, so so that's quite clear in the European context today. Thank you, Jens and Peter. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, I'll read through it and then if you need any clarification I can always read through it again. Uh, so the question is, the difficulty we have with incentivizing deep energy reductions in the U.S. is that our typical incentive programs treat every kilowatt hour saved equally or actually value the initial kilowatt hour saved higher than the last. How does the German government justify to the financial markets the progressive incentive rates for deeper renovations, where apparently the last kilowatt hour saved is being incentivized at a higher level than the first kilowatt hour saved. Um, that's a, um, a good question again, which is um, I can't answer this on behalf of uh, the the German government, but I can give you a, a perspective from from my side, and that is um, if you go for high targets, uh, uh, studies which we have done, for instance, here in GBPN on 
uh, which were presented on by Sophie in the beginning of this, is showing that if we go for a shallow renovation first uh, and not go deep, then we will lock in a potential which it would be very expensive to come back and pick up uh, fast uh, again. Uh, we might need to wait another 30 or 40 years before those buildings are ready uh, for a new renovation. So uh, I think it can be justified in the way that we, if we really want these deep potentials, then we need to encourage people to go as deep as possible. And the way that uh, Germany have done this is to use uh, the KFW funding uh, to make an incentive scheme which is incentivizing people to go as deep as possible because that's the way you get the most uh, support from uh, the bank. Um, and it also has shown that uh, when often when you do an energy renovation this has a big impact on the people who live in the building or who work in the building uh, because you have uh, scaffoldings outside, you have pollution from uh, machines, uh, you have maybe in some cases you need to move people out of the apartment and move them in again. And again you can say if you do everything in one go, you only have to move people one time and you only have to uh, make these kind of trouble. So I think there is a lot of reasons for uh, going deep and maybe it is exactly the government's role uh, to ensure that uh, the conditions become so that people think let's go deep in the in the first place. So that would be uh, my uh, interpretation of, of why this is done. Uh, this is Yabina. Uh, I agree with what Jens said and uh, if you look at it from a governmental perspective, the only way to decarbonize uh, our building stock is to go as deep as possible each time we innovate. And the incentives are provided by governments. So it is uh, the most rational thing to do is to provide incentives uh, for, uh, for deep innovation instead of providing incentives uh, to encourage shallow innovation. And I think more and more governments are uh, starting uh, getting this because, uh, especially in energy dependent countries, uh, because there is an economic impact, a negative economic impact uh, on uh, importing uh, energy outside the country, energy that we waste, uh, and it's like double or three times wasted in money, because then we incentivize uh, something that doesn't reduce this energy dependency. Um, at the time I was at the IEA, we have done this exercise for at least two countries, France and Netherlands, and uh, from what I remember, even Netherlands, who is not in similar energy import situation like France, uh, it didn't make sense at all for a country like Netherlands to provide incentives uh, that uh, to, to incentivize shallow renovation that locks the savings potential. Because what we need to keep in mind is that um, the renovation um, cycle, and it's not the energy renovation cycle, we are not yet there, the renovation cycle, the average uh, renovation uh, time for that in the OECD countries is 30 years for residential sector and 20 years for non-residential sector. So basically if today we incentivize shallow renovation, we lock ourselves uh, for at least 30 years or 20 years in non-residential sector uh, with uh, taxpayers' money. Uh, and I think uh, probably more analytical work needs to be done for each uh, for each country individually. Uh, but overall, what we need to keep in mind is that uh, the the message to the market actors is um, we we don't have uh, we don't have any more the time and the money to waste uh, by locking ourselves, and we have to avoid that. That's why deep innovation is the only option possible. Thank you. And if I may add uh, one comment to uh, from uh, the, the German case, uh, it, it is shown that uh, if you do something very shallow, you might not uh, create new jobs because you are only supporting what already would happen. And the KFW schemes have shown to create 300 to 400,000 jobs, and they have created a, a revenue for the government 
which is higher than the cost for the government of running this scheme. So I think it's, it's um, relatively easy to argue for that this is a good role and this is well invested uh, public money. Uh, so that was just to add a few notes uh, from the slides. Thank you, Jens and Yamina, for the responses. And moving on now to the next question. It asks, how feasible do you think it will be to implement embodied energy greenhouse or slash greenhouse gas metrics alongside policies that also address operating improvements in your community or country? I'm, I'm happy. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I was just saying I was, I'm happy to, to start out on this and say that the closer we come to zero, uh, the more important embodied energy will become. And mm -hmm. when we reach the zero, everything we do is embodied energy. So the more advanced we get our building codes uh, and the closer we come to this magic zero, the more important it becomes to look at the embedded energy. And uh, if you're far away from the energy, I remember some of these studies, it showed that uh, you need to go very dramatic before you should ask this question, but now when some countries start approaching zero energy, I think they have to start uh, going into these kind of uh, what do, does it cost and especially what does the energy efficiency measures uh, cost in, in embedded uh, energy. Yeah, I, I fully agree with the with Jans. The the embedded energy is question for uh, zero energy buildings. It's not really question for uh, the renovation of the existing building stock because we are far away from zero energy buildings. And when even when we renovate deep deeply, uh, only few buildings uh, could go to zero energy uh, consumption. And uh, currently, what the market is delivering is far, far away from zero energy buildings. So it's a bit premature question for uh, zero for existing buildings, but it's a real question for zero energy buildings, for new buildings. It means. Yes, um, I, I also I, agree. I, I also agree. Sorry. Oh, go, go ahead. I, I also agree with this. Uh, uh, that uh, for renovation of existing buildings, it's not really an issue today. Uh, I would just add, when we look about the uh, uh, new buildings, low energy, zero energy buildings, we should not only look on embedded energy, we should look at uh, sustainability. It includes also water, uh, chemicals, uh, sustainability in a broader sense of the, the building materials and the whole cycle of the building. So it's a broader perspective than just embedded energy. Thank you. Yeah, just one last point uh, after what Peter said. So maybe for zero energy buildings we will have to work on new metrics that takes into account the resource efficiency and not just the energy efficiency part in the operation phase. A um, couple of things I want to add on this. I think that while it's true that the embodied energy becomes a larger factor, with a zero energy building or as we move towards zero energy, something that uh, a number of folks here in the U.S. have been really thinking a lot about lately is the fact that all of the new materials put into both new buildings and renovations, um, even though they may represent a relatively small fraction of the overall lifetime energy of the building, that's that's a carbon load that it, it's, a, it's front end loaded in terms of the building's life cycle. And because we have this critical 20 year or 25 year window to address global climate issues, we need to be very, very cognizant of that front end load. And I think among other things, what this means is we need to be looking more and more at regulatory mechanisms that incentivize renovation of existing building stock over the creation of new building stock. So we need to, in a sense, step back a ways and look at the overall um, means by which people create new buildings or renovate old ones. 
and we should be favoring renovation with our policies. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, and the next question from the audience asks, what participation rates in voluntary deep retrofit programs are needed to adopt a mandatory deep retrofit requirement? I, uh, this is Yamina. Uh, I think this will depend on the. Um, we cannot have we cannot have one single answer for each country. Uh, I think what matters is that each time the renovation is uh, taking place, it has to be as deep as technically possible uh, to avoid the lock-in effect and to avoid uh, wasting time and money. And then uh, for each country, uh, we need to look at the overall building stock. And we need to look at the overall building stock and then um, uh, uh, set the target based on what is achievable because the, there is another point that we didn't really discuss here is uh, we need targets but we need uh, realistic, uh, ambitious targets and realistic at the same time. What is really achievable? Market actors are not currently um, uh, ready to uh, shift from, uh, I consider that in all OECD countries we don't really have deep innovation happening uh, with the exception of the KFW example, um, we don't know about real deep innovation projects happening. So we need to prepare market actors to shift from shallow energy renovation with low uh, renovation rate to first to deep renovation, there is learning phase and uh, then increase the, um, increase the renovation rate over time. Uh, one point that I think Peter mentioned before was that uh, the renovation uh, sh uh, should happen with, uh, the, the energy innovation should happen with the renovation cycle of the building. Uh, because the renovation cycle of the building is a great opportunity to, uh, to have the energy renovation included. Um, unfortunately, in the current situation, uh, it's not the case or the energy requirements are so low that we lock the savings potential. So to answer this question, we need to have to know for which country and then um, the IEA developed methodology to make these calculations and they will be happy to provide more inputs about the methodology for, uh, to the person uh, who answered this question and then you can make calculations for your own country. Thank you. Great, and I'm actually going to I would like there. to. Oh. Yep, go ahead, this yeah. is Jens, I, I would like to, to jump in and say we have seen two ways to get to the magic zero that we are going for. We saw the, uh, the building codes in Germany and uh, Denmark both going uh, down and squeezing out of the energy consumption until we reach the first uh, the zero and then the positive energy. We could do the same with existing buildings. So First we uh, require energy renovations, maybe 30%, then we go to 50%, then we go to 80%, and then we go to 90%. So we could slowly increase the requirement for each building. The other way to get there is maybe a slowly upscaling of deep renovation. And uh, I think the question is pointing at how fast could we go to make uh, deep renovation mandatory. And I think we cannot go from a situation where this exists in less than 1% or 2% of the market. We need to have a significant market so that we don't get bottlenecks, so that people know how to do it right, that the industry can deliver the right products to, to this. So I would say before you can start thinking about making something mandatory, you should probably be sure that you, can, you have a supply of maybe 30% of the market already. Uh, because otherwise you get too many implementation issues. Great, thank you. And we are out of time, so I'd like to move on now to the um, quick survey that we have for attendees. Uh, and this survey just helps us uh, evaluate how we're doing and improve for future webinars. So Heather, if you could display that first question. And the question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight.
Great. And the next question, please, Heather. The webinar's presenters were effective. And the final question is, overall, the webinar met my expectations. Great, and thank you for answering our survey. And on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I'd just like to extend a thank you to um, each of the panelists for joining us today. Uh, great discussion and great presentations that we had. And I'd also like to thank our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we very much appreciate your time. And I check, uh, in invite everyone to check the Solutions Center website over the next couple days if you'd like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentation, as well as any of the previously held webinars. Uh, additionally, you will find information on other upcoming webinars and training events hosted by the Solutions Center. We are also now posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Please allow for about a week for the audio recording to go up on the Solutions Center website and a little bit longer for it to make its way onto the YouTube page. Uh, we also invite you to inform your colleagues and those in your networks about Solutions Center resources and services, including the no-cost policy Ask an Expert support. And with that, hope everyone has a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solutions Center events. And this concludes our webinar.